Well, good morning, New Day family. Happy Easter. And GI and the kids are absolutely delighted to be with you. Um, delighted to finally be here, part of the New Day family. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, so soon I can get straight into it and give a little input on this most important of days in our calendar. Uh, in case you didn't know, it is Easter Sunday. So if you didn't, wake up. If you did, great. Happy Easter. If you are wondering whether I have sprouted antlers since you last saw me, I haven't. I'm just enjoying the sunshine and the glorious Easter weather at our new house in Bamba Bridge. So I'm outside in the garden um, recording this message for you. So today is Resurrection Sunday. We've had Good Friday and all these years later I'm still not quite sure why it's good but I know I'll get over it. Anyway, we're going to look at the story or at least a part of the story of the resurrection today. It's from John's Gospel and chapter 20. And if you if you know anything about John's Gospel then I'm sure you're aware that the whole of John's Gospel for me anyway is about the new creation. So from where it starts in John 1 1 where in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, it talks about Jesus as part of the creation and then Jesus being the pivot of the new creation. He was always there, he always will be, he's in all things. John loves in his gospel to allude to the story of creation and in chapter 20 it's no different. He begins with chapter 20 verse 1 sorry he begins with on the first day of the week and then later on he mentions it again. Why does he do that? Why is that so significant? Well it is because he is summing up the story of creation. Um, he's drawing a parallel, an immediate parallel to Genesis 1 and 2 where God uh, brings the created order into being and we see that. We see that very, very clearly. So on the uh, sorry, on, on day six, God creates man. And on the sixth day of the week of the Passion, Pilate brings Jesus before the crowd and he says, what does he say? He says, behold the man. So Jesus the, the pivot of the new creation, the pivot of the Easter story is presented to the people in the same way that God presents man to the world. Sadly, on this occasion, the creation doesn't receive him well. However, there is an ironic twist of fate in it because um, as I said, John 19.5, Pilate says, Behold the man. John 19.6, he declares to the people, Pilate declares to the people, I found no guilt in him. What is he really saying there? He's saying there's nothing wrong with him. Or, in a different way, he's good. This man is good. Why do you want to kill him? In Genesis 1, how does God speak of what he's created? He saw that it was a very good, Genesis 1.31. Day 7, in the story of creation of course, God rested. Day 7 in the week of passion, for Jesus, he was in the tomb. It was a day of rest. 
I don't want into I uh, don't want to get into a huge um, theological debate about what could or could not have happened while he was in the tomb but ultimately he wasn't with us he was absent he'd been crucified he died and he was in the tomb there was a peace there was a love and then of course on the first day of the week is the resurrection Easter is the beginning of the new creation with Jesus as the linchpin. I want to just take a bit of time just to look at a few verses from John chapter 20 um, and then I'll try and expound them to you and hopefully you'll get something new, a bit of a different twist on this um, most well rehearsed of Christian stories. So John 20 and verse 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So, Mary and the disciples have found the tomb empty. The disciples have abandoned her. They've gone back. She's there, distraught, not knowing what to do, wondering about all the wonderful and amazing things Jesus taught and did. And then she's confronted with a man asking her, why are you crying? What's going on? And of course, she doesn't realise it's the resurrected king. But here he is. And what we see in the story is Mary seeming to to grasp at Jesus to to cling to him as though he is graspable and we know he was resurrected in bodily form we do know that um, but I think we need to be aware that Jesus really isn't someone or something to be grasped at but we do that we can be like Mary we grasp at truth at doctrine uh, relationship we want to cling to the things that help us feel comfortable especially in uncertain times such as now we hang on to old things not realizing we're being given something new and here you've got Mary trying to hang on to probably all the amazing things Jesus had said and done he'd gone he died and now suddenly he's here in front of her She's wondering what on earth is going on and she's failed to realise that this is something entirely new. Jesus genuinely had died. He had conquered death and hell. But now he was back. He was back to claim his rightful place and to take all of us with him. I've I've heard a lot recently about how bad things are. I've heard some terrible stories. We've known people who've had the virus. We've, we know people who are working on the front line, leaving their family in uncertainty, putting themselves in an incredible and unprecedented place of risk. And I have no doubt that that's true for many many people um, the current climate is awful truly awful but I truly believe as part of the family of believers we have an incredible mandate God has given us an opportunity and I, I, I don't think it's it's ironic or coincidental that Easter hits us slap bang in the middle of this pandemic I believe wholly that God 
is giving us, Jesus is giving us a new opportunity. And just as he rose from the dead to give us new life, as he gives us something new in that, as he was giving Mary something new and she tried to grasp at it, grasp at it as though it was old. God is presenting us as the family of believers with something incredibly new. And the first thing he does is he gives them, us, excuse me, a new task. Verse 17, John 20, 17. He says to Mary, when she realises who it is, go tell the others. Go tell the others. Go do the work of, of an evangelist. N.T. Wright, a favourite author of mine, says, The word was always the point at which the creator and the creation came together in one. And now in the resurrection, the word is the point at which the creator and the new creation come together as one. As I've said, the resurrection is the beginning of the new creation. Easter is the beginning of the new creation and we've got, we're charged with this incredible new task. So, it's today is a new day, it's the first day of the week and we have a new task, church. New Day Church with your recently acquired and now official new name, we have a new task. Go and proclaim the resurrection. And I, I appreciate that whilst I'm saying it's a new task, it isn't an entirely new task because we've had this mandate already for 2,000 years odd. However, I think sometimes we don't fully see it as it should be we underestimate what it is we we often look at this as a something personal for us to be grasped you know I want my salvation by faith through grace I want to be justified through faith alone and we've almost got this Christmas mentality about our faith it's about what what, what, what do we get but actually, Jesus is giving us something in this to give away. And the resurrection, the proclamation of the resurrection, for me is the true power of the gospel. It is the very thing that must be proclaimed. The true gospel is the resurrection. There is nothing else. And we have that freely available to us to give away this new hope of new life. In spite of our present circumstances, we're still able to do that, even now. And we need to get away from this Christmas mentality. Yeah. Easter can be like that for us as well, can't it? What do I get? I want chocolates, I want some presents, I want something new. But Jesus has given us something new and it's it's this most amazing of invitations and opportunities I was listening to um, UCB on Monday Thursday morning um, better known to some as Passover and the the host of the show talked about giving Easter away and he talked about what he, he always did over Easter, how he'd, he'd give um, little Easter eggs and gifts and he'd, he'd just give them to his community and, and, and bless who he could. And, excuse me. He, he stated, even with all this going on, I'm still able to do that. I can still give Easter away. I can still give away hope. And when people ask me why I'm doing it, he was able to say, because there's a new hope, there's a new life, in spite of everything. He used the analogy in John 13 of Jesus washing the disciples' feet at the Passover to show them how to love one another and give themselves away. And even now, we can still do this in very simple terms. I know we literally can't wash one another's feet unless you work for the NHS or one of the frontline services. 
but we can do simple things. We can give small gifts, pay compliments, encourage one another, especially those less fortunate than ourselves. We can, um, we can look after our neighbours, and when I talk about our neighbours, I mean our very neighbours in our communities. We can bless our communities. We can pray for each other. We can still pour out for one another. We can serve and support those less fortunate than ourselves in our localities. We can go and get groceries for them, medication. We can give them a phone call, a message through a window, anything. There's so many ways we can still engage with people and share the gospel with them. And I know as part of New Day Church, even though we've just joined, uh, we're, we're part of the WhatsApp group where there's so much love and encouragement. And we've got to hold on to this because it isn't just for now. It builds hope and it gives opportunity to share the resurrection even beyond these uncertain times. Food bank is yet another way, such a simple way of getting into people's lives, being able to bless them. But when they ask, why, why do you do this? You, you're not just doing this to make yourselves feel good. We get to share the gospel with them. It's, it's incredible. And they're just two of the simple things that we're already doing. But we have got something far greater to give away than encouragement on WhatsApp and food. You see, we know Jesus went on to give himself away in the ultimate way for his disciples. He said, this is how you love one another. And then he went on, of course, to say, actually, to love one another, you lay your life down. And that's what he did. But he did it for a greater hope, the resurrection life. And we can share that this Easter. As Mary clung to Jesus, as she clung on to what she thought was the old thing, even though it was new and redeemed and restored, he said something utterly astonishing to her. Again in verse 17, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, again, I don't want to get into complicated Trinitarian doctrine with you right now. I just want us to understand the simplicity of Jesus' message to her. What was he telling her? He, he was saying the good news of this new thing, that this resurrection life is for all. My God and your God. That's the hope but for the church, for our communities, for our unbelieving neighbours, even those who oppose us. And I know recently uh, some of the members of the New Day family have come under that scrutiny. I know this has happened to us. We've been opposed for our ideas and our views. But I want us to take heart in that because actually Jesus said, know for sure that persecution will come. You will be persecuted for my name's sake will be but even then we still get this remarkable opportunity to share my God is your God the God that I believe in the God that flung the stars into space and just created galaxies with his fingertips and made us formed us out of the dirt he offers this astonishing invitation saying I'm not just their God, I'm your God too. And we can, we can share that. We know, as Peter tells us in his epistle, he's patient. He doesn't want any to perish. 2 Peter 3, 9. But everyone to reach repentance. He wants everyone. God wants everyone to experience the joy and the glory of resurrection life. And of course, Peter isn't saying to us here that none will perish. He's not saying that. We're given a choice. We have this hope, we can share it, but every person has a choice. But God is patiently waiting to see the fruit, the first fruits of creation, to see and people being redeemed and being brought into his kingdom people knowing what it is to experience resurrection life
what does that mean for us? It is a wonderful opportunity, but it's also a very, very serious responsibility. And we do relish, or we should, as believers, relish the opportunity. But let us not forsake the responsibility. And we've got both right now, in this time, in my opinion. So let's not shrink back. They are unprecedented times. And so therefore, I think we need to engage with unprecedented methods. And I do think it's wonderful how the church at large is finding new and innovative ways to communicate and gather and be community. Have any of us wondered about the timing of all this? I mean, why now? I'm not sitting here suggesting that God has sent this upon us. It's not a scourge to afflict us or a punishment, but how incredible that it happens now when we've got these incredible ways that we can still keep in touch with one another and communicate with one another and stay engaged without actually having to meet one another. We can still reach our neighbours, our loved ones, our friends, our communities at the touch of a button without actually having to touch them. This leads me to the last thing I want to say. John 20 verse 18. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. It was the woman, Mary, who saw the Lord. She was the first witness of the resurrection. And John is very, very clear on that. And of course, if you know anything about the culture of the day, then you'd know that women were not only second-class citizens, but a woman's testimony was legally inadmissible. That meant if, if there was a court case and a woman testified or a woman was a witness, it wouldn't be accepted. Um, in other words, what, what's happening here in the story, of course, is that Jesus has given the mandate to share the hope of the resurrection with someone who ultimately wouldn't have been trusted in their society to share it. Yet Jesus uses Mary as his resurrection mouthpiece. She was the very first resurrection evangelist. What has Jesus done here? And how has John pointed, what's John portrayed? Well, he uses a previously unacceptable way of getting the message out. I suppose some might say innovative. So what about now? What previously unacceptable methods can we now employ to spread the gospel? Friends, I've got to tell you, I have not been a great fan of social media. I, um, I prefer to refer to Facebook as Disgracebook. Um, I think there's a whole lot of nonsense on there. But I have to admit that now um, some of these forums, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, they're coming to their fourth Zoom. Um, we're using them more and more to stay connected. And, and I, think it's, I think it's imperative that we do. Uh, I think we, um, we, we shouldn't give up on staying connected. We shouldn't take lightly uh, the incredible opportunities we have to stay connected and to communicate with one another. We know we really need one another. But if we didn't have all these, these mediums, right now we wouldn't have church. We wouldn't have community. And yet, in these amazing times, we still have, we, we're still able to do much of what we do, albeit in perhaps a, uh, a slightly more restrictive way, but nonetheless, we can still engage with one another. I genuinely believe that the Lord is using this time 
as an opportunity to do a new thing in the church. I believe this was needed. Um, I know not everyone will agree with what I'm saying here, but I think it is a poignant time. And I recently read a blog from a friend who's a pastor in Manchester, um, and I totally agree with what he said. He, he basically drew an analogy of the early church and what's happening now. And his point in his blog is, we're heading back there. We're having to find new and innovative ways of doing community. And if we look at how it started there, in the book of Acts, the church was just a, 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 a scattered composition of house groups. The church was in houses. And yes, I know that um, people were able to go out and they could meet together, but mostly they were doing it in hiding. They were hiding from the Roman persecutors. They were hiding from some of the Jewish persecutors. So they met in houses and they did it in secret. And I know we're not doing it in secret, but right now I believe we are heading back there. We're heading back almost to the the house church model of the early church where each of us has to be a priest in his own household. If you know anything about the um, Pharisees in scripture they get a terrible terrible rap but if we if we know anything about their history then we know that their primary function was to uphold purity laws and traditions in society and it was so ultimately each person could function as a priest in his own household in other words the holiness of God would be in every single household in society and unfortunately what we get to see in in the scriptures is a, is a lot of first century bias because they they were so opposed to Jesus' message that many of the um, the gospel authors and the early authors, they, they were so vehemently opposed that what we get is their bias. So they were quite against them. But actually, in most people's eyes, they were good. They were a very, very positive thing because they were trying to keep the godliness in society. And, and you know, moving on from there, then we get the early church again in houses, again with just lay people trying to do um, spiritual stuff um, with their families, with a, a few, a, a small few gathered together. And I think we're going back there. I think we're going back there having to find this, these innovative ways of getting the message out. And we stay connected, but God is calling us all to be priests in our own household. And I, I do just want to leave you with a, a, a quote from my friend's article. All our old certainties must now be replaced with faith. We have prayed that we would be like the church in the book of Acts. You have to be very careful what you pray for. Acts 2 was house churches. There were no buildings for 300 years. Where everyone, women too, get over it, was a leader if they were a Christ follower. By Acts 6, they were struggling to organize support so they empowered more leaders. By Acts 8, persecution was all that would move them out of comfort and into revival. Acts 28 ends up with Paul in a house for two years in Rome awaiting trial by the emperor. And Acts 29 is now and being written in our day as the Spirit of Jesus is still moving. That's why I pray with hope no matter what, because I believe that what will emerge the other side of this little ice age really will be a church like that in Acts. Stronger, scattered, humbled, purified, and in most places, poor and persecuted and glorious. Perhaps the authentic church will not be the allowed and authorised church. In any case, what comes out of the box won't fit back in. Welcome to the next normal. You're all invited to be part of it. 
So friends, I, I wonder this morning, are we ready to take responsibility for the resurrection of the Son of God? Are we ready to share it and transmit it in these new and innovative ways, unashamedly? I'll leave you with the charge of Paul, who in Acts 28 had been under house arrest for two years. It says, Acts 28, 31, he was proclaiming the kingdom and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. I wonder today what, where we'll put our limits and our boundaries. Or will we allow ourselves to uh, succumb, if you like, to these incredible new and innovative ways and do community. So when we come out of the other side of this, we're stronger, we're greater, we're better. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you take this time and you use it. You use it to make your church a shining example of light in our society. And I pray that we would, we would remember this time, we would remember this Easter. We would remember the hope, the glorious hope of the resurrection that we have. And we would not cling to it, but seek to give it away as freely as you've given it to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. We look forward to being with you all in person, hopefully very soon. I hope you all stay safe and stay well. Happy Easter.